In the Catholic tradition, beauty is understood as a philosophical and ultimately a theological category. It was the Franciscan theologian Saint Bonaventure who first numbered beauty among the so-called transcendentals. Beauty is considered a property of being itself along with truth and goodness. This refers in the first place to God who is being itself and hence truth, goodness and beauty itself. Art therefore, as the expression of the beautiful, is capable of revealing reality to us. Sacred art in particular has the ability of manifesting to us the beauty of God. The current catechism of the Catholic Church includes a section on this theological understanding of beauty. Here I would like to cite the very concise version found in the compendium of the catechism published in 2005. So, in the context of the Eighth Commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, the compendium raises the question, what relationship exists between truth, beauty, and sacred art, and offers the following response. The truth is beautiful, carrying in itself the splendor of spiritual beauty. In addition to the expression of the truth in words, there are other complementary expressions of truth, most specifically in the beauty of artistic works. These are the fruits both of talents given by God and of human effort. This remarkable passage affirms the intrinsic relationship between truth and beauty and recognizes in works of art, which are born from the divine gift of human creativity, forms that are capable of expressing truth in ways that go beyond and complement language. Modernity has contested precisely the transcendent dimension of beauty as expressing or revealing truth and goodness. Beauty has been detached from the order of being and in a radical turn to subjectivity has been reduced to an aesthetic experience or indeed a matter of feeling. This has been part of an intellectual revolution, the consequences of which are not limited to the art world. The Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar has seen this very clearly. He dedicated several volumes to what he termed theological aesthetics, recalling the idea the Catholic tradition has taken up from classical Greek philosophy, especially from Plato, that truth and goodness attract us because they are beautiful. Thus, what is morally good, in other words, what ought to be done becomes self-evident. However, when beauty is disconnected from this intrinsic link with truth and goodness, when it becomes totally autonomous, then the good loses its force of attraction and becomes simply a matter of choice, one possibility among others. The moral consequences of this intellectual revolution do not concern us here. One consequence of this isolation of beauty from truth or being has been a phenomenon described by the Italian philosopher Remo Baudet as the apotheosis of the ugly. By this is meant an aesthetic theory and practice that rejects anything that appears to be beautiful as a deception and holds that only the representation of what is crude vulgar and low is capable of expressing truth. No doubt the ugly is present in the classical tradition as well, but it serves as a contrast, a backdrop to the beautiful. You may think of images of the last judgment where the devil and his fallen angels are painted in grotesque and monstrous ways to highlight the contrast with the beautiful reality of heaven. However, what Baudet means by the apotheosis of the ugly goes much further. Beauty itself is suspected as being deceptive. And the consequence is that beauty is no longer sought. Such an analysis of the state of the arts in the modern world is shared by critics of renown, such as Jean Claire, who made an outstanding contribution to the court of the Gentiles in Paris in 2011. This was an initiative promoted by the Pontifical Council of Culture in the name of Pope Benedict XVI, evoking the temple in Jerusalem, which had a court for the Gentiles who were some distance from the sanctuary but still related to it. They were not quite ready to cross the threshold but they were not completely removed from it either. The idea of the court of the Gentiles included a relaunch of the dialogue between the church and the arts. At this occasion Claire published a very remarkable analysis of the state of the arts in the contemporary world especially with regard to the sacred and does not spare his criticism for certain forms of artistic expression that have been admitted into churches. Ever since the turn to the subjective, which results from 
Enlightenment philosophy, especially Immanuel Kant and the Romantic movement, it has been extremely difficult, if not impossible, to restate the metaphysical foundations of beauty. I consider a recent and very fine book by uh, Roger Scruton on beauty an excellent example of this upper ear. Scruton is also aware of the need to recover these metaphysical foundations that were eroded in the 18th century when aesthetics became a separate philosophical discipline, but in the end cannot do so and must limit himself to the judgment of taste. Certainly an education of aesthetic taste would go a long way, but in the end, de gustibus non est disputandum, there is no accounting for tastes. Postmodernity or liquid modernity, as the Polish, Polish sociologist Sigmund Baumann describes it, has only exacerbated this predicament by its distrust of meta-narratives and its dismissal of metaphysics. For instance, when it comes to the building and furnishing of churches, the appeal to beauty is riddled with problems. Renzo Piano's church of St. Pius of Pietrocina, Padre Pio in San Giovanni Rotondo, or again, Renzo Piano, or Raphael Monio's cathedral in Los Angeles may not be to our taste, but how are we to challenge someone who finds its architectural forms or the space it creates for the assembly beautiful? The above mentioned passage from the compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church offers us a starting point for a response as it continues to say, sacred art by being true and beautiful should evoke and glorify the mystery of God made visible in Christ and lead to the adoration and love of God, the creator and savior, who is the surpassing invisible beauty of truth and love. I suggest that a renewed reflection on the sacred will lead us towards a renewed appreciation of the intrinsic connection between beauty, truth, and goodness, and towards criteria for the discernment of its concrete expression. The sacrum or sacred in the Christian sense is not to be understood in a vague or generic sense, but as referring to the solemn public worship of the church, the sacred liturgy. 